nice to be here. I'm actually not teaching this quarter, so it's fun to see students for a while. Um, and I thought I would begin by annoying you, um, by giving you a question, and not just a question, but kind of a cloying question, like what really causes violence and conflicts? Like you're all out there thinking, well, of course, you know, um, what causes violence and conflict? Men with guns, right? Armies, rebels, terrorists. Um, but you know, I'm not gonna tell you about any of that. Um, and so I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about something that you haven't thought about. Uh, and to start you off, I just want you to think back um, to what happened in Ferguson, Missouri after Michael Brown's death. How many of you guys remember the Ferguson, Michael Brown event? So, so, you know, basically you had some police violence. Oh, sorry. You had some police violence. Uh, you had some peaceful protests to protest the police violence. You had some looters that took advantage of the protests to destroy some property, you know, steal some, th some things from shops. And then you had the police treating virtually all the protesters as if they were looters, at which point you get an escalation of violence. Well, that dynamic, we have actually a whole cottage industry of political scientists that study that, that study the way that ordinary citizens' actions can feed into violence, like the looters uh, in Ferguson, um, and start a cycle that leads to more or less violence. And that conflict dynamic, they call it the microdynamics of conflict, um, they argue is really what causes conflict to spread in many incidents. Now, um, I think that this is an amazing research agenda that has really transformed the way we think about conflict. But the problem is that these ordinary citizens don't have to feed into conflict. They can also feed away from conflict. And so when citizens feed away from conflict, we call that civil action. Now, civil action can be, like in cases of civil resistance, quite contentious. They don't have to agree. They don't have to be nice. Um, but in other situations, it can actually be action to try to mediate, to try to change the way people behave by tamping down violence, not just by trying to change uh, political agendas. So just to give you sort of an idea of how this might work, let's think about the Ukraine. Um, so uh, here we have uh, the, the peaceful protests that led to President Yanukovych's replacement in, in Ukraine. Um, you have, uh, and, and so without any violence, you have a president leave. Then when you have some of his supporters take up arms, um, you get the international community stepping in to try to help. The OSCE sent monitors, the international community got engaged to try to get the Ukrainian government and the Russians to agree, which they did in 2014. Then, when you have armed militias continuing the violence, you get cities, people in cities, deciding to take matters into their own hands. In Donetsk, you get peaceful protests. In Maripol, you actually had steel workers from one of the major steel companies there patrolling with police trying to tamp down violence and restore order. Now, the Ukrainian conflict is still ongoing. Whoops. Um, but we do have evidence of conflicts where this kind of civil action has actually led to conflict, the resolution of the conflict. Um, and here we have a picture of 2003 um, Liberia. Uh, there you had peaceful protests that were animated by a widely reported sex strike, which was instrumental in getting President Charles Taylor to agree to ne negotiate with the rebels. We've heard talk about Colombia already, um, but one of the stories that you might not have heard about Colombia is the degree to which a pro-peace consortium of business leaders has been instrumental for many years in establishing hotlines between rebels and the government, in um, funding peace bonds, um, and in developing a number of conflict-sensitive practices so that when businesses are operating in conflict-oriented zones, they're not um, feeding into the conflict. But 
Civil action doesn't always lead to the end of conflict. Even when it doesn't, though, it can affect the level of local violence. So here we have two cities in Mexico. At the top is Monterey, um, which is an industrial hub in the northeast. In the south is Acapulco, a tourist destination and uh, a major port. In Monterey, you have, again, a consortium of business leaders, but this time working with representatives from the national government and also civil society groups in order to generate an alternative peace force one that wasn't corrupted by drug money. And they are watched by a citizen's watchdog group. And people are able to report crimes through social media apps. Um, and these are crimes that are undertaken by criminals and drug lords, but also undertaken by the government. So the, this is really giving civil society an avenue in to, um, to influence in Monterey. All this added up to the violence in Monterey went down. In Acapulco, on the other hand, you haven't had the same kind of coordination or civil action. You've had a lot of um, individual action to hire private security, to pay off the drug lords um, and their extortion uh, requirements, and um, <laughs> violence has remained unchanged. So the level of local violence can be affected by civil action. But even in cases when the level of local violence isn't affected by civil action, civil action, you can still get civil action affecting civil space, affecting the ability of people to just go about their daily life and maintain their relationships. And there's just a few examples up here. Um, the one uh, over on the far right is, is actually a barricade that some local artists in Mariupol decorated um, to sort of make light of the fact that they're constantly getting these attacks. Um, in the, in, on the uh, or that's on the left. On the right-hand corner, we have, um, uh, this is during the siege of Sarajevo in the 1990s, where women would put on lipstick and dress up and walk about the streets as if they were living in a normal city as a way of sort of maintaining some kind of protest, um, which interestingly um, appeared to have some effect on um, the ability to uh, mobilize uh, uh, armed personnel from Sarajevo. In the bottom, you have um, one of the more dramatic and heart-wrenching um, examples of the moment, which are the white helmets uh, in, in Syria that uh, were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. These people are just amazing, doing work, rescuing, uh, but also rebuilding, educating, doing other kinds of things um, in that uh, very desperate environment. And this is important. This is important for these people's day-to-day -day lives, obviously. But it's also important because it maintains those relationships, or in the case of the white helmets, really um, enlarges them. And those relationships will be the key to governance um, after the conflict is over. And they might be the key to generating some movement toward um, uh, some diminishment of local violence and perhaps even um, ending the conflict. So with a group of colleagues at the Corbell School, uh, we are undertaking research on civil action. And uh, our hunch is that our exclusive focus in academia, the people publishing the APSR that you just saw, um, on states, we all talk about states, on macro narratives of conflict, and on violence and violent actors alone, has really distorted our understanding of conflict's dynamics. And we think that by studying some of the civil action that's going on, we're going to get a fuller understanding of conflict and a better toolkit um, with which to deal with it. Now, um, with the help of the Carnegie Corporation, who's funding the research, but also funding our experimentation in innovative ways of thinking about bridging the gap, um, we are trying to bridge the gap with this research. And part of it is bridging the gap simply by doing research that 
is broadening our understanding of conflict and broadening our set of acknowledged tools for dealing with conflict. And already we are seeing policymakers coming to us and wanting to understand more about who are these various groups and actors that are undertaking this kind of action? What can we do to influence them? How can we support them? Um, so, so we're having that kind of effect. But I think more important is our realization that the only policymakers are not um, government officials. You also have uh, movements. You also have international organizations. You also have academics that are trying to um, influence policy. You have companies. All of these actors are important in bridging the gap. So, whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I had one more slide. Um, so just to go back to our, um, our beginning, what really affects violence and conflict? We all do. And we hope that by understanding some of the civil action that is undertaken um, in conflicts, we might get a better sense of um, sort of acknowledging and documenting its impact and perhaps make it more common. So thanks so much for having me.